The first talk is, uh, uh, is by Jamie Haddock, and it's on stochastic gradient descent methods for corrupted systems of linear systems. Thank you, Jamie. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, oops, let me go back up. Um, first of all, thanks to the organizers for um, converting this so quickly to a virtual format. Um, I'm excited to be speaking and to, especially to hear some more talks. And um, I think the first opportunity to give a talk while I'm wearing slippers. So that's really exciting. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk today about some variants of stochastic gradient descent that we're using to solve systems of linear equations, which have really large scale and arbitrary um, number of uh, corruptions. So the problem we're considering here is to solve an overdetermined system of equations, AX equals B, um, but where some of the entries of, of B are not trustworthy, they've been arbitrarily corrupted. Um, here we're considering this, the scenario where we have a very, very tall skinny matrix. It's highly overdetermined. Um, and so these corruptions, while um, you know, important and, and a challenge are not devastating to being able to uh, locate the solution to the ideal system of equations. Um, so let me just set up a little bit of notation. So we're gonna imagine A here to be an M by N matrix with M much, much larger than N. And we'll consider just for simplicity, the scenario in which all of the matrix, uh, the, all of the rows of the matrix have a unit norm. So they've been normalized. Um, and we're seeking in this case a, a solution X star, which we're going to denote the pseudo solution. Um, that would be the solution to the uncorrupted or ideal system of equations. Um, so here we're imagining that we have some kind of collection of um, uh, corruptions held in this sparse vector B sub C. It's gonna have at most beta times M non-zero entries. So that means beta is going to be the fraction of the corrupted entries. And our problem really then is that given knowledge of the matrix A and the corrupted measurements, um, we'd like to design an algorithm which will recover the pseudo solution and do so efficiently. And specifically, we're interested in using variants of row action methods like randomized Kashmars or SGD, which are gonna use individual rows of the matrix A. We denote these A sub I transpose. Okay, and one question which we'll at least give some partial answers to is for which matrices can we obtain such a guarantee? Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk about the first approach, which is going to be a variant of the random Kashmars method. It's likely I don't need to go through describing what the randomized Kashmars method is, but um, just in case uh, as a refresher, it's an iterative method which produces better and a be better approximations to the solution. Uh, of a system, consistent system of equations um, where the updates are produced by taking the previous update and orthogonally projecting onto the hyperplane solution space to, a, to an equation sampled from the system of equations at random. And you just do this over and over again. And um, for a consistent system of equations, you're guaranteed um, that you'll converge to the solution. So each of the index it, and indices in your uh, system of equations corresponds to a hyperplane and RK is just projecting orthogonally onto these randomly chosen hyperplanes. And it's known that RK has good convergence properties when the uh, system of equations is consistent and the matrix A is uh, decently conditioned. Um, but one unfortunate truth is that randomized Kashmars, as I've stated it, would handle corruptions very poorly. So I'll go through a couple of kind of pictorial examples. So if we had a consistent system of equations, randomized Kashmars, of course, is um, just updating iterates by sampling hyperplanes and then orthogonally projecting onto them. And so it's easy to see that you're going to be getting closer to the system, uh, to the solution um, with every step of the iterations, <clears throat> okay? However, when, oh, excuse me, um, let me just say also, so, um, there's a nice convergence rate known uh, for this method. So in the case when the system of equations is consistent and we use a probability distribution over the indices of um, the rows, which has probabilities proportional to the squared norm um, of the row, um, then the iterates are gonna converge linearly in expectation. And so here the um, expected error the expected squared error is decreasing as a geometric sequence with this nice convergence constant, which depends upon uh, the scaled condition number of your matrix A. 
Okay, however, like I said, unfortunately, this approach is for consistent systems of equations. And so it doesn't handle the corruptions. In fact, the corruptions are devastating to the behavior of this algorithm. So here's a little simple example, which you know anyone can imagine their own versions, um, in which you see that just the single step which um, selects one of the corrupted equations, um, you lose almost all of the progress that you've made in previous iterations, bringing you towards the solution. Okay, and here's a, a just an empirical example. Um, what you're looking at on the y-axis here is the squared error of um, the randomized Kazmaier iterates over many iterations of a run um, on a 50,000 by 100 Gaussian system, but in which a thousand of the measurements have been corrupted. And you can see, of course, you know these spikes are occurring when we sample one of the uh, corrupted equations, and we just lose all of the um, previous uh, gains or even more. Okay, so um, the general idea of the methods that we're thinking about are um, to try to avoid making projections that pull us too far away from the um, solution uh, that kind of damage all of the progress that we've made. Uh, and in particular, the first method I'll talk about um, is just going to try to avoid those projections by not projecting if the sampled hyperplane seems to be corrupted. Um, and so the idea is if you consider the set of all of the distances from the current iterate to the hyperplanes, if the sample distance that you've, you've sampled is you know, unusually large compared to the distribution of distances, then you just shouldn't project onto that hyperplane. Okay, and to quantify that, we're not going to project if this sample distance is larger than the median of all of the distances. And there's really, there's nothing too special about the median. Other quantiles are possible. They're likely better um, depending upon the, the fraction of corruptions that are in your system. And uh, for efficiency, it's often useful instead of comparing um, your sample distance to the median of all of the distances of the hyperplanes to instead subsample a collection of those rows and compare your sample to the median of just the subsampled number of distances. Uh, Jamie, I have a quick, very quick question. So yeah, absolutely. if you determine that the distance is big, do you discard that equation because it's corrupted or you keep it? No, we, we keep it so we can resample it. Um, but likely if it was already too large, you know, as you were kind of far away, if you've gotten closer, it's just going to remain very large. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so the, the um, uh, pseudocode for the method we're proposing is given here. So um, generically what this is doing is it's sampling some of the rows of your equation. Those are going to be um, the distances that you're going to compare to. You sample a single iterate, uh, excuse me, a single index, and you compare the residual or the distance associated to that single um, entry of the residual to the median of the entries of the residual from the sequence um, I1 through IT residual entries that you've also sampled. And if it happens to be lower than that median, then you're going to take that RK projection. Otherwise, you're just going to sit in place and not accept the RK projection. Okay, and um, we're able to pr prove a convergence result, um, at least in the case um, in which A is a matrix with, which has rows sampled uniformly over the sphere. And in that case, we, with some high probability, um, and assuming that the median RK algorithm is not subsampling, it's using the full um, number of rows, um, then we can prove a uh, convergence rate, a linear convergence rate in expectation. Okay, and a couple of other technical assumptions, we need that the fraction of corruptions beta is smaller than some fixed positive constant, and we need that N and the ratio M over N are sufficiently large. Okay, so if all of those are satisfied, even if this small fraction of um, corruptions are chosen adversarially, so placed adversarially and chosen to have values adversarially, um, this will still converge uh, because we'll be avoiding those, um, th those selected corrupted, high, uh, corrupted equations with high probability. Okay, so um, kind of the summary is that if A has incoherent rows, then the convergence bound for RK holds up to some constants, even in the case of adversarial corruption. 
Um, this result essentially holds with subsampling, although there's some kind of technical um, things that we have to handle. Um, so I didn't present that result. And this can be generalized to other notions of incoherent rows. Um, generally, we can uh, handle some uh, types of sub-Gaussian uh, distributions on A and not just uniform over uh, the sphere. Okay, and there's three steps basically to this proof. Um, the first one is we need to show that this median is well concentrated around the distance to the, to a, excuse me, a, a scaled version of the distance to the pseudo solution for all points in Rn. Um, once we have that, we do two steps. We condition on choosing a good row and show that these good rows are going to make a fairly helpful contribution um, in expectation. We're gonna get closer to the solution. And then we condition also on choosing a corrupted row or bad row. And we just show that this projection isn't going to hurt too much, basically because the median can't have gone too far away from uh, this distance that we have concentration at. Okay, so let me show you some, again, empirical experiments. So again, on the y-axis is the error, the squared error. Um, over many iterations of randomized Kashmir's methods, um, on a 50,000 by 100 Gaussian system with, again, 1,000 corruptions. So of course, the green curve, the randomized Kashmir's curve, it's you know, not going to converge. There's no hope. Um, however, the median approach is converging. You can see that there are a few little bumps where we are actually sampling one of the corrupted equations. Um, but it's, uh, these bumps are not hurting us too much because they had to have been um, below the median of the distances. So they weren't pulling us too far. Okay, um, an additional approach is instead of using randomized Kashmir's to use um, SGD. So um, under you know, some reasonable assumptions, um, recovering the solution, the pseudo solution to the system of equations is equivalent to just um, minimizing the number of non-zero entries of the residual. Of course, that's unfortunately NP hard. So we move to solve the convex relaxation instead and minimize instead the one norm of the residual. And it's um, pretty classical work now of Candes and Tao and then Candes, Rudelson, Tao and Bershinen um, that the solutions to these problems will coincide exactly. And so um, our idea then is to use SGD with respect to this objective um, where um, we're taking again a step in the direction of um, the subgradient of this um, L1 objective uh, and we're going to control the step size a to k using some statistic of uh, the entries of the residual. Okay, so uh, a quick little side note is that the optimal step size, um, if you're trying to make progress towards the pseudo solution um, for this L1 SGD step is uh, pr fairly easy to calculate. So you're trying to minimize the next residual, um, excuse me, the next error term, squared error term, um, and you can define this in terms of the previous squared error term, which allows you then to compute analytically um, this optimal step size A to K for this method. So it's, it's given by the expectation of uh, this term, the sign of the residual term times the error term inner product with that, that sampled row. Okay, and in that case, if you use that optimal step size, um, in expectation, you again get this um, uh, convergence where now the error terms um, are decreasing, hopefully, provided A to K star is um, positive, um, <clears throat> with uh, a constant that depends upon the current iterate. Okay, and um, this, you know, knowing this A to K star is, of course, you know, uh, um, too much to hope for because that's the solution we desire. Um, but if you could approximate eta star to within a small constant factor, then you uh, can obtain a near optimal guarantee. And so this is what we're going to try to do. Um, we'll use a statistic of the residual that we're hoping approximates eta star. Um, and unsurprisingly, the statistic that we use is again, the median. Okay, so um, again, we're gonna sample a subset of um, rows and then we'll decide that the uh, step size we're going to use is just the median of the residuals associated to these rows. And then in this, this method, we always make the step 
that step just uses the step size equal to the median of the sampled residual entries. Okay, and um, what we find um, empirically, so this is for a um, Gaussian system size 5,000 by 100 with 500 corruptions. And what we, we find empirically is that using this median statistic as the step size um, performs basically as well as using the uncomputable optimal step size, um, at least for this, this uh, scenario. Okay, so um, as long as the number of corruptions isn't too big, the median size seems to perform nearly optimally in practice. Okay, let me just um, wrap up with a, a few experiments. Um, so the first experiment, um, perhaps one question that might be kind of hanging around is, does the quantile choosing the median for median RK really matter that much? And the answer is no. Um, so this is for a 50,000 by 100 Gaussian system where we have 30% corrupted entries. I'm plotting the relative error versus iterations of a bunch of various methods um, which use different quantiles for whether to accept an RK iteration or not. So you can think of these um, orange and blue curves that are kind of way up near the top as being a very cautious version of this method where we're only accepting um, the step if the distance the step is going to make is less than 10% of all of the other um, residual entries or distances. Okay, and then as you move down, once you get to this yellow curve, this is a very brave version of this method, which is saying, I'm only, I'm going to accept, um, I'm only going to reject 10% of the um, sample distance, distances or residuals. Okay, and of course, what you're seeing is um, basically if we're choosing um, to accept um, no more than 70% of uh, the residual entries that we're getting, um, uh, convergence, and that's because we're avoiding, with high probability, the 30% of corrupted entries um, that we put in the system. Okay, so we see something very similar for uh, median SGD. So here I'm I'm plotting um, uh, just the L1 SGD method, which uses step size that selects the um, corresponding quantile of the residual entries, and um, here we see that only once we get up to 0 0.6 are we getting real, um, I guess maybe 0 0.5, we're getting some um, damage uh, from the 30% corrupted entries. Okay, and then the final experiment um, varies the size of the corruptions. Um, so this one's very, I think, um, interesting. Uh, it shows, in fact, that um, a large corruption size, so, you know, this kind of adversary has really thrown off the entries in the B vector um, corresponding to the corruptions, um, that really doesn't affect in any way the behavior of these methods. Um, because again, we're using the median, and so this is just really um, blowing up some of the entries of the residual that we were going to ignore anyway. Okay, so, um, I'll finish with a few um, open uh, questions um, which deal with um, this method and the variants that we've discussed. Uh, so how, first, how does the analysis of median RK extend to matrices with correlated rows? So you know, uniform over the sphere is already a very nice scenario. Um, it, you know, we'd like to prove something that can handle a kind of significantly different distribution of matrices. Um, and then uh, the analysis that we use, so you, you notice in the theorem I presented that I didn't give the constants. Those constants come from um, a bunch of um, concentration inequalities and other um, results dealing with random matrices. Um, and so those constants tend to be pretty bad. And so we're hoping that there might be a better analysis which gives constants which actually match the empirical results, which are vastly different than if we actually use the constants. And then finally, um, we've been investigating versions of median RK which um, are, uh, which actually are greedy. They order the um, residual entries and they choose the residual entry, which is just above the known number of fraction, uh, fraction of constraints. Um, and we don't have any um, analysis for that type of method 
that justifies uh, the behavior that we're seeing in empirically, which is very, very strong. Okay, um, that's the end. Thank you again. Thanks a lot, Jamie. That was very interesting. Uh, I think we have time to take one question or maybe two quick questions. I don't know if any, anyone has a question. Uh, I have a question. Yep. Uh, so uh, I want to ask if this does connect to a linear search method. And another question that, uh, what makes you think this way? What, what, from where the idea coming from choosing, like, does there is any previous work that's similar with other algorithm to that? Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm going to answer the first question, which is, I don't really know what you mean by a linear search method. Um, if you can easily say what it is, maybe I can, can answer. Like in linear search, we usually we drop like the samples that not gonna improve uh, the way to the optimal point. That's what we do usually. Okay. Um, I mean, it sounds very related. I I, can't, I don't know. I don't have a, a better answer off the top of my head. Um, to answer your second question um, regarding kind of where did this idea come from? Um, so there has been some work um, previously um, more in the area of linear feasibility, um, which attempts to solve versions of the, the um, max feasible subset problem using these types of relaxation or projection methods. Um, I have some work with uh, Deanna Nidell um, where we used um, this, I kind of built upon those previous works and use the idea of um, kind of identifying corruptions by their residual, by the size of their residual entries, and then actually doing kind of like Salim um, recommended or suggested and, and flagging those um, equations. We sort of um, said, you know, if we keep seeing that those have large residual entries, then we're going to become more and more certain that those should be um, corrupted and should be discarded. Um, but this idea of using the median as the, um, uh, kind of statistic for um, accepting the projections isn't something that I've seen elsewhere. Um, it's a good idea of my co-author, uh, William Swartworth. So. Okay, this is great. I mean, I think there's also some room for discussion. How How is this result? Sorry, my time is over. But because I can see this as a as a, as a linear code, and then I'll be interested in, in seeing, but, but we can discuss this later. So thanks a lot, Jamie. That was very interesting.